with that, I'm actually going to hand off first to Teresa, who will give us and walk us through some of the latest and greatest in Chat Copilot. Can you guys see this? Yep. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. I can't really see my team's message, so Alex, I'll count on you for um, highlighting any questions that we have in the chat or any comments. So what we've done since the last Copilot chat update, um, and the one I'm referring to is the three video walkthrough that I did with Alex back in June or July. Um, so a lot of updates have been made to chat Copilot to kind of simplify the experience and make it more plugin oriented. So the first one that we did was we now have this new settings dialog where you can kind of turn on and off some features that you don't want to use for chat copilot. Um, and that includes like the multi user chat and like live sharing. Um, one thing I'll call out here is I we implemented this reinforcement learning from human feedback. This is only on the front end. And it's basically just to show like to show if you can like upvote or downvote some of the messages. And in theory, if you were to implement this, you would hook up this kind of feedback to your backend to be able to train your model. This isn't hooked up in chat copilot right now. We just wanted to showcase that as a um, suggested LLM design for your application. So the settings dialog is all front end. So this just controls the features that you as the user will see on the front end. And then you'll also be able to see your different versions now from the back end and the front end. I'm running locally, so it doesn't have a version. And if you want to see all the features from Chat Copilot before, you can just turn this off and then it gives you everything that you were used to whenever Co Chat Copilot first launched. Um, one thing you'll notice too is that we also now show token usage. So if you're looking at it from the settings dialog, it will show you your token usage for the entire session that you've been on the web app. Um, so like, for instance, when you're running it locally, this clears out every time you kill the app and do yarn start again. And it is broken down by each kind of part, each kind of hop that we make to the LLM back in the web API. And we don't have planner usage yet, but it will be coming soon. And um, so that's the gist of it. You can also see it in the prompt dialog. And this is the token usage that's specific to the response that was generated for that message. Um, OK, so I'll stop there. Any questions? Cool. And then so the next big thing that we introduced was custom plugins. So now you can just port your chat GPT manifest file to into Chat Copilot and test it pretty easily. There are some limitations in that we only support plugins that don't require auth or require like basic user HTTP auth. And that means something like a personal access token that you can pass in. And let me get a plugin that we can use. So our PM Matthew built this math plugin since the LLM can't do math that well. And so you would be hosting your manifest file as defined by OpenAI um, at some domain. And then you pass this domain in. And then it will valid, like it will fetch the manifest file, validate that it has all the prop, um, proper fields specified, as well as the open API spec. And then when you add it, it becomes a part of this plugin gallery. This isn't persistent right now. It's only to the session that you're using the web app. So um, be mindful of that. And then in order to use it, you have to explicitly enable it. And then you can be, you can ask it to use whatever it needs to. And it should schedule that plugin and then come back with us for an answer. Um, I currently have the stepwise planner running, so it might take a little bit longer than if you were using action planner or sequential planner. So we can come back to that. Um, so any questions about the plugins so far? You meant like like an off token on the header, right? Like that, that works is kind of what I heard you say. Yeah, so if you've 
uh, if you guys have played around with the GitHub um, plugin at all, basically it'll ask you for your personal access token and then you can input it that way. And so if your manifest specified a user HTTP, it will automatically pull up this UX for you whenever you add your plugin to the plugin guy alert. Yeah, like a hugging face token or something. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, and then so that's basically the gist of the custom plugins. I can walk through some of the code if you guys are interested in that. I have some of the files pulled up, but I'll move ahead with the other features that we have. So like I mentioned earlier, I have stepwise planner running. So the other big improvement we made to Chat Copilot was stabilizing the planners. So the action planner, the sequential planner, and then we introduced support for the stepwise planner. And the stepwise planner is super awesome. Like it's able to generate user inputs based on kind of this like feedback learning loop that it makes off of these observations. So it goes through this loop of like chain, a chain of um, like thought, action and observation until it's able to get a correct answer. Um, there's Alex has a video on his channel with Lee walking through this, but you can see here we have it in the prompt dialog under the planner results section. And basically it will list out all the steps that the stepwise planner has taken in order to get the answer. So in this case, the planner is only invoked if you have a plugin enabled. Um, so it starts off with a question and that's basically the user intent. So it has all of this context. And then for the action, it sees that, oh, like I have this plugin that I can use to get the final answer. And then it schedules this action. It works like the other planners where it schedules the variables and it populates it um, on what it thinks it's right. And then unlike the other planners though, you're not able to approve the steps like as it takes them just because the stepwise planner is iterative. Um, so it's just like loops back on itself and then it's able to get that final answer. So anytime you're using the stepwise planner, you're able to see its thought process in the prompt dialogue, regardless of whether it re uh, receives a result or not. Um, yeah, and then, so this is just merely for informational purposes. So dev have more understanding on how it works, but it's not actually passed into like the meta prompt. The only thing that's passed into the meta prompt is the answer that it got from the stepwise planner. Um, yeah, so- Teresa, be before you move on, you mentioned yeah. some work that you did probably more behind the scenes of stabilizing the planner. Can you walk yeah, through uh, some of that? Yes, yes, I will get to that because that was more so on the action and sequential planner side. So I will get to that in just a moment. Um, but I'll continue with stepwise planner here because I wanted to call out the fact that stepwise planner right now doesn't work that well with plugins that return a large API response. So if you get a huge JSON because that response is passed back to the planner, um, it, can, it can easily exceed like token limits. So just be careful about that whenever you're using the stepwise planner, but it still is super fun and useful to use, especially if you need kind of like that feedback loop for additional user input, or if you enable a plugin like Bing, so it can do like live web search in order to do it. Um, uh, so also we have uh, the quadrant thing, right? For like writing out like your context window to like a vector DB if you wanted to. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so I won't be showing action planner or sequential planner at this point, but I'll go back to like the stabilization that we did. So if you go over to app settings, you'll see the planner like options section here. And by default, sequential planner is um, enabled. So if you want to change it, you can just change it to stepwise or action on whatever you want to play around with. Um, I will say sequential planner and action planner works best with GPT-3.5 turbo with a relevancy threshold set or GPT-4. Um, and the stabilization that we did was one, this missing functions error um, because the planner is basically a call to the LLM to generate a suggested plan. It can sometimes hallucinate functions that it thinks will add value. Um, for instance, like, we've seen it hallucinate the function like filter because it's trying to like filter out the response of the plugin. Um, 
but we added this skip function to allow that planner to essentially bypass the hallucinated functions when serializing the plans. Otherwise, it would just error out and it would throw an exception that says, oh, this function isn't available in the kernel. Um, we can't create a plan right now. So by allowing skips, we allow it to schedule these missing functions and then we filter it out from the serialized plan. Um, and this was purely for stabilization. Uh, for working on the hallucination part. And uh, this one is allow retries on invalid plans. So again, because it is a response from the LLM, sometimes it can come back with like a natural language preamble that says, oh, a suggested plan is this, and then give the JSON. Um, or sometimes it will just say, oh, these are the steps that you can take in natural language. So we found that if we allow retries, um, there, this by default is only one retry then it will return back a valid JSON or a valid object that can be serialized rather than it can't serialize a natural language plan. Um, and then these, this config is just like up to you on how you, much you want the stepwise planner to run and use. So that's pretty much it for the planner stabilization stuff. Um, we have seen some errors where it will throw an error about like token exceeded limit, but I that's more so on the model. And if you just try to resend the message, it should be a transient one. So that's it. Any questions for planner or stepwise planner? Um, so like the, the feedback thing is literally just like, like a JSON, like a link to a UUID for a JSON on the thing, or like, are you guys planning to do like an actual pipeline to help build like, uh, direct preference optimization like data set for like continual fine tuning and and I'm not uh, saying y'all have to do that I'm saying like that's like I just didn't yet so no yeah no heard we are not planning to build that pipeline because we don't really um, train our models specifically but we just wanted to showcase that because it is a pretty relevant um, LOM design to be able to give your like users the option to kind of cater the responses that the model gets. So we just wanted to show that for demonstration purposes only, but there's no hookup to the back end and we're not planning to do any kind of like pipeline to set that up with the model. Cool. Uh, I think Alessandro had some, go for it. Oh, me? Yeah, you said you yeah. had like a question uh, yeah. related yeah. to this yeah. and yeah. MapReduce. So I watched a video yesterday that talked about using MapReduce to parallelize the work on large inputs and maybe mm -hmm. when they are re-examining the output, the outputs of this thing. And your JSON comments about the size of the input and output made me think about that. Is there anything related or something about that or can be done? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I have not heard of that, but I will look into it. Can you drop a link to like the post or what you were I, referencing? Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's actually already in the semantic kernel and you group, but I'll, I'll, I'll point you to that, you know, uh, later. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, I just got back from vacation, so. so okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So, so that I understand the intent, like in, in, down for the docs too, you're saying like using MapReduce or something to like distill like uh, like a context window to be smaller or to like process it like uh, outside of like like to like a distributed series of LLMs and like give it like a like a substring. I guess I misunderstood kind of what it's doing. It's imagine you have large I, I don't know gigabytes of text, okay, inputted. You know yeah. what that thing is about finding a way to split and chunk. You know, very similar to rag and that kind of thing, but with the purpose of having parallel. Uh, containers or whatever it is, calculate, and then they reduce some more and start another cycle of this. So the, the basically what they're saying is the larger the prompt, the slower the LLM seems to behave or less precise in some cases, and this addresses that plus the scalability issue of large data and large prompts. I'm down, I'm interested. I also wonder like how much of that is a function of like U-shaped attention versus like uh, using something like Tiny Llama, I think. Let me pull it up real fast. But like as a way to pre-process and get a sense for stuff beforehand. Um, let me let me put that in the chat rather than like wait, y'all have y'all like wait while I Google stuff or big stuff. So thanks, dude. 
Yeah, I think it's an overall good question. Just handling big data, right? Even in a non LLM setting, handling big data is, is a challenge. Uh, so if anything, if we've learned anything in the, over the past decade, you can probably use some of those patterns that you use to solve those old problems and see if they fit for this new one. But, but yeah, I mean, whether it's a map reduced pattern or or something else. Reprocessing with a tiny model, a lot of ways to, to do a thing. So uh, thanks, Alessandra. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, guys. Does anybody have any other questions before I move on? Um, OK, and then so the last thing is delete chat is now in chat copilot. And what delete chat will do is it deletes all the resources that includes like the memories, the documents, the messages, um, everything when you delete it. And if you're using multi-user chat, it deletes it for all users. And any user can delete it. I think that's, oh, the last one, sorry. The last one is now um, you guys have probably noticed you don't have to log in initially to chat copilot right now. It defaults to guest mode. Um, so how this works in the back end is we just have this um, guest user GUID, like a static GUID that we use for all users. Um, so then this should help with some of the kind of like boilerplate stuff that you had to set up in order to get into chat copilot. Um, but if you do want to use it, there are instructions in the repo in order to enable it. You can't use graph without being logged in. Yep, that's it. I will hand it over to Tao now. Great. Thank you so much, Teresa. And welcome back from vacation. Mm -hmm.